Hi, my name is Carrie Strope, and I'm honored to help share this demo, Flameworking Soft Glass on the Lathe, with my friend and colleague, Mark Cornblue. Over the course of a couple weeks, over the last couple of months, I've filmed him in his studio, Lincoln Hot Glass in Lincoln, Nebraska, as he was working on the multitude of vessels that we're about to share with you. Mark has been blowing glass since about 1995, and he started on the art fair circuit and now works mostly on vessels at the lathe for at least the last year and a half or year that I've been watching. Uh, we'll be sharing the latest technique that he's been exploring after helping a local Nebraska artist clear out her husband's hot shop. Um, would you like to speak more to that, Mark? Yeah. Um, Kenny Walton, who is an amazing Nebraska artist, passed away uh, last year. And his wife, Karen, asked me to, to help liquidate the studio, which Kenny hadn't touched for about 10 years. It was in kind of a falling down barn. Uh, roof had collapsed. Anyway, it was, it was a treasure trove of amazing glass. And I ended up selling off a bunch of glass and tools. And then I ended up going through a lot of Kenny's old tools. And many of them were rusty, uh, really rusty, you know, buried under debris. And uh, I cleaned up a whole bunch of them and I got a whole bunch of that glass. And, and, uh, and I thought, okay, I've got all this, all this soft glass and tools. I should get myself a furnace. So I bought a mini dragon. And over the past six months or so, I've been teaching myself soft glass. And because I'm trained on the lathe, I figured might as well figure out a way to incorporate uh, my skill set with the lathe. So I located my lathe next to the mini dragon and, you know, it's just been a lot of fun. It's been a, a really cool exploration. Yeah. You've got a really great setup back there. Um, you know, as you walk into Lincoln hot glass, there are, um, you walk in and there's a small gallery. You can see the rental stations, the, the torch stations, the student station. And then as you walk into the back of the shop, uh, Mark used to be up with the renters, but now he's got his own little alcove. There is the mini dragon. He's got his lathe. He's got his kiln set up back there. Sometimes he borrows the kilns from up front. <laughs> um, he's got his glass collection over there and he's got a cold working station that you'll be able to see um, kind of in the back of the video while he's working. And uh, then there is all of the, the treasure. So um, I kind of want to pull this up next um, and kind of talk about how you prepare the glass. And let's see. So yeah, we've got uh, buckets. Yeah, yeah this is, um, I, Kenny, Kenny Walton had collected uh, tons of old Fenton glass. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I wasn't able to get all of it but I got some barrels of Fenton Black, uh, the white, the red, and then an assortment of some other colors. But the black is, out of everything that I've played with, the black, the Fenton Black uh, is just amazing. And these were mostly black cats. These are the, uh, the, the mold uh, knockoffs from uh, Fenton Black cats. So now, yeah, I'll take it out of the barrel, clean it up a little bit, and then I preheat the, the Fenton Black to about 960 in the, in the kiln. And, uh, you know, these are days, days when, I, when I don't light the furnace. Um, I do everything out of this one little kiln. And, uh, you know, so I'll preheat the Fenton in the kiln and uh, punty onto it, melt it in the torch, and then I'm ready to go. Otherwise, I, I load up the, uh, the furnace and uh, work in clear. Now, have you, ever, um, have you ever loaded the furnace with Fenton or yeah, I colors? Yeah, I made mistake of loading it with some opaline white once. And it was so stiff. Um, it was really tricky to work with. So uh, that's the only time. And I, I try to avoid, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to load it with, uh, the black because it might take a lot of it may take a long time to clean that black out. So um, what we're looking at here, I guess, is some prep, and you've got you know you've got a, a ton of color rods. You did a lot of cleaning and separation. This is some of the cane work that you've been doing. Yeah, a little bit with. That's um, 
That's some Iron Maiden is what I've got down on a on a rod and chucked up in the lathe. And I'm laying a line of Fenton black. So I'll just heat up a bunch of black and pull my own my own rod. Um, anyway, I've laid a line down of Fenton black and uh, this is corn yellow, uh, a color that I've really gotten to like. Um, pretty sure it's a Zimmerman color. You did inherit quite a bit of twisty cane, right? There was yeah, that the was already color, done. The colors are not uh, the sort of fun colors that I like to work with. Right. So now I'm I'm punting up with a bit of clear glass. So what are uh, your favorite colors? What are my favorite colors? Yeah. Um, well, I'm really I'm really liking chalcedony. Uh, there's like a red chalcedony and a blue. Uh, I'm really liking the uh, Iron Maiden and Moody Blues. What I love is I love reactive colors. I want to see, I want to see transition in color. Uh, it's a lot more organic. It's hard to see, but I, I sometimes reach down and control the speed. Um, I'm changing the, the flame and I'm changing where it goes. I'm heating up and I'm also letting it cool. But there's a lot that goes into getting a nice even pull. Uh, but the nice thing is the lathe, you know, you can, you can spin at any speed you want. So it's really a great tool for making cane. So there we go. Uh, the Iron Maiden um, looks a little bit uh, gray in that, but it, it turns just a beautiful uh, kind of silvery red. Okay, so I preheated my cane and I do all the cane application by hand. Uh, it just, it's not possible to do it on the lathe uh, and get it right. Okay, and sometimes that happens, <laughs> it breaks off. Yeah, but. it's tricky with soft glass, you know, so shocky that... Uh... I mean, you handle it like a master, though. And I sped it up here a little bit, too. Um, yeah. It's about one and three quarters speed there. Excellent. Yeah. So, yeah, I get that I get that wrapped. And uh, with a little bit of space in between. And it's nice how with soft glass, it really spreads out. And, you know. This is a, a great tool, the American lathe. So yeah, I just wanted to edit this in here in the beginning because it's it's a fun technique and I like the vessels that you've made using this technique, but it didn't really fit in and a little bit later. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just such a hypnotic. I figured at this point, everybody, you love this demo. Yeah. Everybody, buy a Mark Cornboo vessel. <laughs> ex ex got got I, any I messages to, you want to give them? <laughs> I just have to apologize for my my... My torch is hurting a bit. It's uh, it's sort of everybody ignore the clog ports on the torch. <laughs> no, no torches were actually harmed in the making of this. Video. This is this is where you got to get all your subliminal messaging in right now, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, this is quite a python. So, so and this off, is this is natural. Yeah, this is this is a the normal speed right there, which is. So cool. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. I mean, the whole process of glass is just hypnotic and entrancing. Yeah, the, the process itself is fun. Yeah, and I just want to pull up a couple of images of some of the vessels that you've made using this cane. They're, they're really beautiful. Those are vessels that I did a while back, like long before we started shooting. Okay. Was that some of the cane that Kenny had twisted already or is this? No, no, that was that all, that was okay. all my cane. So yeah, that was some of the prep that happens um, in advance, but now we're on to the main event here. And this is one of the days that you have the furnace loaded up and I know that it might not be your your favorite working with the Oceanside Cullet, um, and we can talk about that a little bit, but I really, I liked 
um, being able to show this part of it because with the clear glass, you can really see what's going on um, with the gather and where the tools are and everything. So I think here you've got, um, I don't know, maybe that's some Iron Maiden that you picked up. What are you doing right here? Um, yeah, I think I, I think this might be, I, I think I'm punting up some Moody Blues. So Sunspot Moody Blues. And I, I've got it, uh, you know, I went into the furnace to just get a, a little gather so I could punty on in the kiln. And now I'm going to transfer it to this smaller rod. So I kind of keep, I keep a lot of colors in the kiln uh, ready to go. So they're, they're puntied up on the right size rod and preheated. So that's what I'm doing here. Okay. So getting that prepped. And I'm assuming, you know, you, you melt it in and then you shape it into something that's a little bit thinner than maybe the cane or the rod that it came in. Exactly. Yeah, I kind of elongate it, and then uh, before I stick it in the fir in the in the kiln, I'll cool it off in the water just so it doesn't stick. Quench it real quick. Yeah. Give it a little quench just to make it a little easier to deal with. Okay, so now I'm I'm going to get another gather and 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 kind of prep my my tailstock. Uh, this is going to be the foot of the piece. So I use this little V-marber a lot. Um, you know, unlike traditional glass blowing, I'm not shaping this. I'm, I'm just applying it. So I, I don't really want to cool it much at all. I want it to stay liquid so I can get it on that, uh, on that punty. And then I'll shape that a bit. So I, I, I want to emphasize here that a lot of the, the, uh, the kind of luck that I've been having with colors comes from avoiding using wooden tools entirely. Uh, the, uh, the wooden tools were, were reducing the glass too much. And so I, I really mostly work with graphite, which I think is a little bit unusual for soft glass. But it's something that I've learned. I, I get much better colors with graphite than I do with wood. So. Uh, yeah, it is kind of unusual. And, and you know, I, I mean, I remember uh, watching some sand casting, uh, uh, like a hot glass demo with Bertil Valian and him doing some sand, glassing, uh, sand casting and hitting that with a graphite spray. But that's the only time that I've really seen any graphite tools in a hot shop, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot of what I've put together is, uh, you know, sort of comes from my experience with flame work. And uh, so I really, I'm really applying a lot of flame working technique and tools to, uh, to, to studio glass. Okay, so now I've got, I'm getting my, I'm just sort of preparing my tailstock. Um, this is probably one of my favorite tools, it's the infinite rim mold. I've, I've got to get myself a much larger one for bigger work, but <laughs> it comes in handy. So yeah, and then the ocean side uh, is, is a great material. It's much softer than the Fenton. Um, the Fenton, uh, for example, when I use the Fenton black underneath, it, it creates an interesting support. I think there's a, a term in glass, a dura, you know, it's kind of like working with a stiffer glass. And so really the combination of the, of the, the softer color and the stiffer glass underneath is, is definitely a winning combination for this technique. It's interesting. It's like the Fenton's a skeleton and the, the ocean side is the organs and the skin. Yeah. Yeah. But in this case, I'm, I'm doing solid ocean side because I'm using the, the furnace and, you know, it's a great, it's a great material for that 96. And speaking of that, so a lot of people, when we've been posting some of these teasers on social media, they've been asking what COE is everything. And the ocean side, of course, is 96. And the Kugler and Reichenbach, I believe, are both 96. But you were saying the Fenton is 91? Yeah, the Fenton is 91. But uh, I, 
I think that when you work, when you work thin the way I do, uh, it's a lot more forgiving. And uh, I've been able to combine uh, the Fenton Black is is very compatible, and uh, you know, it, it's uh, you know seems to be working fine using thin blown technique. I think if you were to try to sink it in you know deep in thick pieces, uh, you, you may run into some trouble. Right. So, yeah. Anyway, one thing that uh, I want to point out here is that when I'm blowing out these pieces, my, my gather is really about the size of a walnut. Um, you know, I, you really have to be very uh, minimal because this is, again, this is a thin blown technique and, uh, you know, really blowing these pieces out thin. So it, it, uh, if you have too much of a gather, you won't blow it out thin enough. And if you don't blow it out thin enough, the colors uh, act differently. Uh, too much heat, they don't cool fast enough, and you won't get the effects that you're looking for. So the other thing that I think is unique to this technique is that I can superheat the glass. And, uh, you know, I'm bringing it up to temperatures that you, you really couldn't achieve in the furnace. So yeah, this is an overlay, so a solid color overlay. Uh, pretty easy on the lathe. You notice I just uh, put a gather on the top and just just uh, marbled it all the way back and around. Yeah, I really love watching that. And there's another one where we'll look at it from a different angle again, too, because I, I do think it's so pretty. <laughs> the other thing I do that, that uh, may be somewhat unorthodox is that I'll dip my graphite in water to cool it down. You know, when it gets too hot, it, uh, it can stick. And so I keep it cool. I was afraid in the beginning that this would destroy my graphite, but I was surprised to see that it really doesn't seem to bother it too much. You know, beats it up a little bit. But anyway, um, you never want to use beeswax on your graphite. Uh, Unless. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you, you never want to use it in, your, in one of these marble molds or, or your marber. Uh, because especially when you blow these pieces out thin, if you hit it with, uh, with beeswax on your marble, it may stick and just rip the piece. So, but you will use, it is a good idea to use a little bit of beeswax um, on your, you know, when I'm re using a reamer to open up a bubble. Yeah, and we'll see that. Um, we will definitely see that later too. Yeah, I mean, and on the, on the metal tools, you know, definitely. But, uh, yeah. but graphite, uh, the, be very, yeah, don't, don't use beeswax on the, on the marble or the marble mold. And yeah, so I did mention before that we're, we're watching this first one in clear specifically for that reason right there, because you can see where the tool is, you can see the bubble develop. And again, later when it's time to pull this off of the punty, it's, it's much easier to see where the pipe is and how you're pulling it away with the tools that you're using. And as you're heating, um, you're, you're kind of using that marble mold to stabilize the glass, but also I've noticed um, you're kind of establishing a jack line with the marble mold I am, at the same yeah. time I'll sometimes. Use, I'll use the edge of the marble mold and uh, apply pressure using the edge to, to sort of cut a jack line. Um, I'm also using it to cool the glass uh, so I can get a nice even blowout. So I'll, I'll apply the marble almost like a, you know, you know, just as, as a way to, to, to manage temperature. All right. Yeah. Heat management. And so now I'm, I'm, you know, I want to really, uh, you know, get everything nice and hot and flat to the bottom of the glass and the, and the, the glass uh, in the tailstock flattened a bit before I apply it. So um, this is this first one is definitely kind of an overview of the entire process up to where we pop the bubble. But um, for anybody that's unfamiliar with a lathe, can you kind of talk about some of the parts and considerations and, and what's going on here? Like as you're using it, I guess. 
Well, I'm doing a lot of I'm doing a lot of heat management using the Bunsen burners, and uh, you'll see me change their position a lot. Um, and I'm also my right hand will reach down to basically roll the tailstock back and forth. So there's a little wheel. Uh, I've also, there's also a wheel on the carriage that holds the torch. And then on my, around my left hand, there's a speed control. And then below my speed control on the bench, I've got my, my fuel control. And I'm using natural gas. And uh, natural gas is, uh, I believe, a huge advantage when working with color. Um, it's just. Do you think it's less reducing, or? Yeah, I think it's a lot less reduce reducing than propane. And uh, I, I wonder about getting the same technique. I haven't really tried it that much with uh, with propane. We're about to when we do the demo with the furnace at, uh, at the next. Oh, show. that's right. But. Um, yeah, so far uh, I'm really uh, I'm really sold on natural gas. Um, I, ca I call my studio the color kitchen. You know, it's sort of like a a lot of what I love to do is just experiment with color and uh, learn what all this amazing glass that I've collected does. I have a lot of respect for for a lot of this old glass. My overlay here was actually um, Iron Maiden. And here you're using a, a Kevlar yeah, blanket. Yeah, wet, wet piece of Kevlar. So occasionally I'll use I'll use Kevlar to to sort of smooth and shape. I I prefer that over newspaper just because it's easier. So you'll also notice that I don't use a blowpipe. I use a, an inflator. I have a little bubble inflator. Let's see if we can catch a catch a view of that oh we've got we've got lots of that coming up. okay um and now, well and the blowpipe is um it's a, a like a mini donia blowpipe that you're using there and then it is yeah it's a it's a denial blowpipe um i i also when i work bigger i'll chuck up a, a cutoff blowpipe sort of okay. a full-size blowpipe that i've cut off and um but for for cups and vessels this is, this is an excellent little blowpipe particularly right here i love watching um you use the marble mold to pull all of the glass off of the blowpipe so you've just i mean you could see a second ago where that blowpipe was eh, half an inch inside the the vessel you know and now it's it's completely gone and this is more of a I don't know this is more of a scientific or i guess lathe working uh borosilicate technique obviously that yeah, you're doing it, here it is it's uh you know I'm, I'm popping this bubble the way you would in scientific glass rather than using uh, my jacks to cool it <clears throat> and creating a you know and then and, and tapping it i've done that but i when i work thin like this uh i find that that you know that it's just very hard to to make a crack in thin glass that doesn't travel down a bit and this is just much easier. I, I uh, when I'm not being lazy, I'll spend more time cleaning uh, to get a nice even opening. So now I'm just using my tailstock. Uh, you know, I'll keep the same glass on all day, just add to it, uh, keep it on. I'm using it just as a, a way to gather. Now that's a little bit of iris orange. I would say this is my favorite color to work with. This is really the color that I think people may be most interested in because this is the color that um, I've been getting some amazing effects with. Not so much over the, the ocean side. Uh, you'll see, you know, the effects are a lot more interesting. Um, I, I don't know what happens with the ocean side, but it seems to neutralize the colors a little bit. Whereas the Fenton Black uh, uh, doesn't react with it at all. I was going to say, you um, you definitely get the color reactions to really pop on that black base, which seems counterintuitive that any color would pop on top of black, but it's pretty amazing. Um, and also, I wondered, 
did you just kind of stumble upon the color combination that you like for using this process? Because they're the same three colors that you, I think you're using for most of what we're doing here. It's the iris orange, um, the Fenton red, the corn, um, the corn blue yellow, the the um, the Zimmerman corn yellow, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah. then and then there's a purple. Yeah, the the gaffer purple. Uh, let's see, royal purple. I think is an amazing color. Because um, you have a whole wall of rods that you have yet to use, but you've already ordered more iris orange. I, I've gone through a lot of iris orange, yeah, and I've ordered more of the gaffer. And you know, I'm I have a lot of great colors, um, but I really, as I was saying before, I, I like the colors that that are reactive, and a lot of the old Zimmerman colors are really fun and interesting to work with. Um, in fact, there one of my favorite is is silver is Zimmerman silver blue, and I've done quite a few pieces of silver blue over the ocean side, and that looks great. Um, but again, the the best combination is going to be um, the iris orange over black. That's what really pops. So anyway, I'm just preparing my tail stock again. And, uh, I want to assure people that I will be sending my torch in to get the jets. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So in, in amping hard. up the excitement for this demo, we, we posted some fun stuff and Mark has taken a lot of guff for his torch face. So he's a little sensitive to that, but it looks great. It functions great. And if you watch the over the shoulder views, you can see what he sees, which is, you know, it looks like a torch that's working just fine. This is a little bit of uh, Zimmerman uh, silver, silver blue, I think. No, you know, I'm going to have to find out exactly what that is because it's not silver blue. Um, yeah, and this is just a, it's a little bit different, um, just a, a couple different ways that you can work. And I know, I, I don't think that you do much of this color application to the foot when you're working with the Fenton Black, no, right? No, exactly, yeah. I, I, I just like to... I like to add a little color to the foot when I'm working in clear. And uh, this is a Zimmerman deep blue with some silver in it. So it really uh, reduces, but I, I, I wish I knew the exact name. Uh, contact me afterwards and I'll tell you. So yeah, I've prepared the foot with a jack line. And- I think that might be the magical iris orange. That is iris orange. And again, that's a Rickenbach color. And I found a, a few bars of iris orange in this in this giant lot of glass that I acquired and uh, just had no idea what it was. But when I started working with it, it was like, oh my God, this is the coolest. And then I, you know, it was a sort of a challenge to, well, my biggest fear was that it wasn't made anymore. You know, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to find it, but, but it's still <laughs> out there. So this is another technique for doing an overlay where I, I just sort of wrap the piece with stringer. And uh, a lot of my, a lot of my pieces are kind of like those boardwalk uh, spin paintings, you know, is my, my analogy. And so it's a random look. So now I'm gonna. It's very wabi sabi. Yeah, now I think I'm adding some. This is probably some pulled Fenton red. It looks a little darker so, yeah. than it does tend to, to look darker. Now the Fenton red is that some of the cat uh, the angels maybe That's, that you pulled yeah, down or something? Those angels, cats. Okay. Now this is some corn yellow. Now the corn yellow definitely reacts with the uh, iris orange and uh, it, it's just a, it does something, you know, it, it doesn't often come out yellow, but it, it can create a kind of a gold, but you know, a lot of those interesting lines in the pieces are the Fenton red over iris orange and the Zimmerman corn yellow over iris orange. 
So unlike uh, more traditional glass blowing, I get the entire gather uh, really hot and without really being able to see where the bubble is, <clears throat> I, I just make sure that it's really super hot and blow it out evenly. And uh, that takes a little bit of practice. So I think we're going to see the inflator here shortly. There it is. Yeah. 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 So how did you stumble up upon this? Well, you know, I've always, I've always been a little bit nervous about having my, my mouth and lungs in contact from what's, what's traveling through these tubes when the glass is superheated. So, uh, I, um, I, I think I saw that, uh, Olympic color rods had them for sale and they were being used because of COVID because, you know, you can't really be sharing a blowpipe right now. Anyway, I, I got one and at first I just, I used it for a bit, but put it down because I never felt that I'd be able to get the control that I can get with basically blowing out a piece with my mouth. But I, I picked it up again and I practiced with it and it's really worth learning how to do this because in the end, it is much easier to, uh, you know, to be able to blow Imagine a that. Practicing something makes you better. Yeah, there you go. It's crazy. What a crazy thought. It's crazy. <laughs> and then I, I think you, did you just shut the valve there to, to yes. keep your air pressure? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. After you use it to inflate a piece, uh, if you don't close the valve, uh, especially when you're working thin like this, you'll just, as soon as the heat hits the piece, it will pop uh, from the pressure building up. So yeah, you want to, you want to release the pressure. So there I flattened the foot. I've, I've flattened the base of the cup and I flattened the foot a little bit. I'll bring the two together. And then I'll, I'll roll it back just a bit. So now I've got to manage my heat. You know, I'm going to heat up my tailstock really well because past experience has taught me that you can't ignore the temperature of your gather. Even with the Bunsen's on it. Even with the Bunsen's on it, it's good to just recharge it with heat every now and then. And uh, not too much because, you know, you've got you'll lose control, but, um, now I don't know if it works the same with the clear glass, but I know with the Fenton, we were talking and you were saying that it's, it's really important that you are mindful of the Bunsen being on the glass for too long because you might reduce the colors. It's true. Yeah. When you're working with the, not, not so much what I'm working with here, but when I'm working with the black and the iris orange, uh, the iris orange reduces, and sometimes when you get some real nice rich colors, you can lose them by letting them go over the Bunsen too long. They'll, they'll, the metals come to the surface and they get, you know, it gets a bit reflective. Anyway, you see how I use the edge of the marble mold to control my opening here. Um, it took a little practice. Uh, the, the Fenton is stiff and a stiffer glass is much easier to do this technique with uh, when I, I this is really um, some of the first pieces I uh, made in a while with the furnace and the ocean side and it's it's a little wetter and a little trickier so we're gonna look at some different shaping variations here shortly um, so I know that I, I skipped the end of the last cup and this one I think you might open a little bit but, um, oh, nope, we're going to skip on. So I, I decided that, you know, I would show another couple of different ways that you go about um, punting up, you know, if you're not gathering. So you've got some Oceanside Rod where you use that as a gather. Um, yeah. We've got so, the... Oh, go ahead. This is a day when I, um, when I don't fire up the furnace. And uh, it, it really makes for a very easy work day to just throw some glass in the in the kiln because um, when I use the furnace uh, because it's got such a small pot uh, and because it you know it's a very efficient tool 
I'll fire it up and I'll work until it's empty. Uh, but that can make for a pretty long day. But uh, it's it's just a little easier to. Uh, to yes, just the throw. last one, the last one you punted up with the the Oceanside rod because you both your tailstock and your blowpipe were bare. But now you've got the Fenton black on the tailstock that's all melted in, and you're using that as your gather. Exactly. Yeah, I'll, I'll use that just to grab a piece out of the grab a piece of Fenton out of the kiln. Again, it's it's uh, preheated to about nine sixty. And then, so being used to working with the borosilicate versus the Oceanside and the Fenton, what it, I mean, how is your experience working? Like, how does that feel to you? I think that uh, because I am so accustomed to borosilicate glass, I think that working with something like uh, working with Fenton, which is stiff, has been a lot easier for me than, you know, for example, working with Oceanside from the furnace. So I do have a lot more control with, uh, with the stiffer glass. And uh, you know, so yeah, I think, it, I think it's, a better, it's a better glass for the, for the, for the torch. Um, when you it, end up switching in between, because I know that you've got, you know, you've got some commissions for these uh, borosilicate bourbon glasses you've been working on. When you switch back and forth between the soft glass and the borosilicate, do you find that it's difficult, or are you getting used to it? Or, well, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, I do occasionally uh, mix them, mix them up, I and mean, it's really important to not mix the glass in the studio. I've gotten pretty good at recognizing what's what, but um, yeah, I mean, it's I've been doing this for a long time, so I, I I'm pretty good at switching techniques. But that did take some time, you know. It did take some time going back and forth. I, I think working soft glass uh, has made me a much better borosilicate glass blower because soft glass is unforgiving. The way I like to say it, soft glass, uh, you, you have to follow the rules. And, you know, when I was first learning it, I have a, what I call my wall of shame. I've got a, a wall oh, right. that, is, <laughs> that didn't work out. Um, and every time a piece broke or, or went wrong, I, I knew that I had, basically, I had, I had broken the rule, you know, and I had to teach myself the rules. And, uh, you know, and, the same goes for where you place your tools. You know, you, you can't, you have to have your tools all in the right place with soft glass. You can't be reaching around for a tool. So you can't have a messy station. You really have to have everything organized and, and know where everything is. So it's very time sensitive. So yeah, it's relaxing working Boro after working soft glass. I think I about had a fit the other day when I walked in and I thought you were working soft glass and you were opening the kiln to show me these pieces and it was only at like 8.50. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shut that door. It's pretty casual. So I think this is another, um, I think this might be the my favorite shot of the overlay technique. We'll find out here shortly, but it's, yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. Oh, and here you're sticking some of the, the rods that you're going to apply afterwards into your curling iron warmer. Yeah, I, I, got, I got used to using the curling iron warmer, um, something a lot of glass blowers or uh, scientific glass blowers or silicate glass blowers use, and bead makers. Well, maybe not so much bead makers because soft glass can stick to it. It sticks, let me tell you. Yeah. But, but it's a great tool for preheating. And yeah, I use that a lot. All right, so yeah, I'm doing a, a solid color overlay. So I'm laying some iris orange over this Fenton Black. And uh, I do a lot of my own tool shaping. So if you look at this marber, I, I'll, I'll shape my marbers on my diamond wheel. I like to hit the edge of this glass Make sure it all stays soft, and there we go. Oof. I love that shot. Yeah, it makes for a nice, even, even overlay. It's so beautiful. Well, thank you.
Yeah. And then you're going to go in next with your, your, your colors. You're, you've got your, uh, this. Oh, 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 no, we switched. We did the stringer overlay, right? Yeah. That's why, because you do a couple different. So sometimes you do the full color overlay, but you always tend to put the iris orange down first. So this is a stringer overlay instead of the, the full color overlay. Yes, this makes for a slightly thinner overlay. And I'll just lay the stringer down and then I'll do the same uh, technique where I'll sort of, uh, I'll move it all toward the punty. And uh, there's sometimes when you work thinner with iris orange, you get some really cool colors. So uh, this is this is a piece where I'm working a bit thinner with my my layer of iris orange. And then you're going to add your your Fenton red and your corn yellow and your royal purple. Yeah, yeah, those I think those are the colors I've got preheated. And so when you do the overlays, is there a preference when you do a full color overlay versus just a stringer overlay? It's just a matter of, um, of uh, different effects. You know, a full, kinda... full color overlay will create a different effect. A Call different it as you go. Color. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, as you said, it's wabi-sabi. It's you know, it's uh, it's a little unpredictable, a little like raku, what you're going to end up with. But there there will be a difference if you work uh, with a thin layer of iris orange versus versus a nice thick layer. And I think we're alike in that it's really hard for us to do the same thing over and over and over. So like when we were filming these, I was like, all right, I want one of the same thing for three angles. And I know you really struggle with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really, <laughs> you know, blowing glass is, um, is a journey for me. You know, I, it's, uh, I'm always experimenting. I'm never satisfied with developing a technique and sticking with it. And I, and sometimes I wish I, I was a little bit more. I mean, I, 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 I do in a, in a general sense, but I'm always changing. But well, you're definitely developing, you have a style and you can definitely see it, especially if you go on your Instagram feed, you know, you've got all these borosilicate bourbon glasses that you've been working on and now you've got all this soft glass lines. So you definitely have like this technique that evolves. And now I think you're going larger with these because you better request for some larger sculptural techniques in this style. Yeah, there we go. The full blowout. So this is when the colors begin to, to really pop. Yeah, you can definitely see them developing here. Yeah, I like a very organic style. And I, and I, I appreciate that, that I, it, you see a, a consistency. I think I, in borosilicate as well as soft glass, I like, uh, I like to imitate nature. So here you can see your hand on the carrot, uh, the, what is that? The, the tail. Wheel. Yeah, I'm rolling, I'm rolling the tail stock forward and then I'm going to make contact and, uh, and then roll it back just a tiny bit. And then I'll put my marber on the, and shape that foot. So it's, a lot of the time you shape your foot in advance, but I threw this in here because that gather on the tailstock, there was no foot on there and you just like yeah. shoved it up on there. So it is, you, you sometimes do the shaping afterwards and do you have a rationale or it just happens that way? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do sometimes want a more stable connection if I'm, uh, so you get a much more stable connection if you don't, if you don't, uh, Sort of cut a deep jack line and with the lathe it's really important that you have stable connections as you're spinning at some higher speeds um yeah it just depends on what i'm doing like this one is going to have a fairly shallow foot um so i knew that i could i could just cut it after temperature. I've... <laughs> i was gonna say temperature humidity barometric pressure <laughs> so now yeah i'm using the, uh, the marble mold to cut or basically to 
to manage the opening because the piece will begin to wobble. And I, I'm just sort of recentering it as I blow it out. Now I'll use the marber to sort of cool. I, I want it to. I want it to break at the right spot. So I put a little bit of cooling on the forward part of that. And then there we go. We've got we've got our. We got a bubble. And it's yeah. been popped. This one's got some real tequila sunrise colors in it. Yeah, that was really beautiful. Yeah, it's to um, see when they're hot what they're going to become, uh, because a lot of the reds. Uh, tend to be dark brown when they're hot. So I, I kind of rewind a little bit here because before popping the bubble, you can shape the piece and you do a, a couple different ways of shaping the piece too. Um, and I don't, I don't really even, I feel like this one you already broke, but who knows? We'll see here in a second. Um, but I know you could do a couple different techniques where you actually shape the piece differently. Yes, yeah, like if I'm doing a, a vessel and I want to create a neck, uh, I'll shape the neck before I before I release it. And I think we've got one later on where I do that. Yeah. So here I just wanted to show a different angle so people that are unfamiliar with lays can kind of see how you pull everything in and out when you're working on it. And then, yeah, this is the... Uh, the poofed out middle piece is what I call it. I don't know what you call this. Yeah. What do you, what do like you call this? <laughs> satellite, satellite cups or satellite. All right. And uh, yeah, this is a, let's see if I can remember the name of this color. Uh, I think it's like a brown iris. And it also give, it also creates some really interesting color variations, but sometimes it just creates an amazing rich coffee brown. So in this, you're heating up the middle and then pushing the carriage in on itself versus pulling it away, right? Exactly. Yeah, I've got a. I create a, a nice even heat line and then roll the carriage inward to create that Maria. And now you're going to do the opposite. We've got a little vase that you're shaping. Yeah. Uh, so so this way, I, what in this situation, I'll I'll grab the the gather with the tailstock and roll it back as I inflate it. And now I'm using the, the marble mold to delineate where I'm going to create a neck. So this technique works for creating, you know, champagne glasses, anything you want to elongate. I, I try to work with a very oxygen rich flame because uh, it just, uh, it treats the colors better. Um, uh, and so you see how with marble mold, I can del delineate the neck. And on the bench, a lot of times people have foot pedals, but you don't have a foot pedal in your torch. You've, I don't know. Would it help you? You seem like you um, kind of make a lot of adjustments, so I don't know that a, a foot pedal would really help. Yeah, you know, I, I, I used to use a foot pedal, and uh, it would help me be more efficient. You know, it couldn't hurt. But, yeah, I do make a lot of minor adjustments. And even with the foot pedal, um, it was, it was, you know, it always required fine tuning. Do you react, uh, as you're blowing the glass? Do you, do you like see the colors start to do something and then make the adjustments or is it intuitive or, um, because I know you're trying to go for a non reducing flame. So visually, can you tell? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can tell. What are you looking for? The pieces that, that, that really work out the best will, will strike the colors that I 
like as soon as I as soon as I blow it out. And then my goal is to not overwork the piece. You see how I just move the Bunsen burner away because I, I want the piece to remain hot, but I but I'm careful to not reduce the colors. I also am probably cognizant of the tailstock and its temperature, and I want to make sure that the the piece in the tail, the punty holding onto the cup, is the right temperature. Yeah, this one turned out a nice red. So yeah, the, the range of colors that you get from iris orange is really, it's the full spectrum. That's pretty amazing. And I love watching that flame cut. Yeah, and then I, I'll uh, pull that little bit of extra glass out and the pressure will pop that uh, and the way I'm getting the pressure to be able to just remove that little bit of glass is by putting the Bunsen burner directly over the, the blown out uh, base of the vessel. So I needed to create a little bit of heat uh, to be able to blow that out. So at any time, do you go back in and hit the piece with a really oxidizing flame because you've reduced it too much? Does that work? Yes, yes, you can, you can oxidize, you can, uh, you can clean off a piece with a sharp, high oxygen flame and burn off a lot of the reduction, but you'd better be very careful that it's the right temperature. Okay. Uh, because uh, you can also crack a piece if you hit it with a flame like that. And so you just have to be very careful about how you do it. I, I often won't risk it. Okay. So yeah, now we've moved on to different shaping of the actual lip. And so we've got some tweezers that you're going to be using. The reamers use the paddle to kind of help um, center the piece on the, the tail stock, but also to chill the lip, I've noticed. And then you go in with the graphite reamer usually to open it slightly before you hit it with the tweezers. Yeah, just to sort of bring it out a little bit uh, so I don't invert it. Sometimes when I'm working thin like this, I'll actually invert the lip and seal it to the inside of the cup. But uh, in most cases, I'll, I'll bring the lip out and then use these tweezer jacks to, to open it up. This is another tool that I got from Kenny Walton. I'm not all that familiar with it, but it's turned out to be one of my favorite tools. <laughs> so we'll be looking at, I think, like three different cups from here on out and, you know, you, I know like every, every cup, you kind of stop at a different point. So it might not be a cup. It might be a bud vase, but I know that we've got like the, the little lip and then we'll have a medium lip and then we'll have a full on like actual tumbler. Um, so you can kind of see the progression. And I, I assume that it's kind of the same thing every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, there are a lot of different ways to, and I, sometimes I'll do a, a lip wrap uh, after that first stage too. It's very easy to do a lip wrap on the lathe to heat up a, a little bit of glass and 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 uh, roll it onto the lip. But uh, but I like the look of the, the lip wraps look a little too organized for these pieces, <laughs> and so I don't tend to do it. Uh, like Organize your tools, not your glass. <laughs> What's that? Organize your tools, not your finished glass. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, this technique um, reminds me of uh, Japanese pottery and uh, something that I really, really love. I love the randomness, of, you know, and the, uh, the lack of perfection is something that, that's a, it, it's kind of a break from borsilica glass because there's a real push in borsilica glass to be very precise. Absolutely. You know, the whole scientific origins of it, you know, you really, you know, Borsilica glass blowers are very precise, but this is a, this is kind of a fun, uh, you know, a fun format to work in. Yeah. 
and and you just really you're working with a much more difficult material and you, you kind of have to go with it and the other thing is the lathe will make a fairly uniform piece look like it's not uniform because of the rotation um, so pieces pieces that don't look uniform are actually quite a bit more uniform than they look well and especially since it's mostly your foot and the the bridge between the foot and the the gather that tends to wobble a lot I think. yeah it will get loose and uh but you really have to adjust it you can't you can't keep working if that begins to wobble when you're opening up the cup or you'll you'll throw the whole thing off so Right now, I can see that the, the mouth of this is lined up with the tailstock, but but the but the ring, that sort of compression ring, is, you know, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. Throw it out. Yeah, and these no. are things, <laughs> these are things when you see when it's rotating at the you know, <laughs> these this revolution per per minute, not that visible in the finished piece. So yeah, a lot of balancing of heat, you know. Mm. Love watching it. It's really fun to watch it on the lathe, actually. It's very mesmerizing. It is mesmerizing. So. Yeah, I, I really enjoy this technique. And again, we're working so thin, it's it's hard to uh, impress enough on people how these colors, in order to get these colors, you really, you're working very, very thin. So I think I'm just, I'm just heating up my, my reamer a bit. And I nice little wax oh, pile over there. Yeah, I'm dripping down my lathe. <laughs> and some of these pieces that you've done, you've done, you said, mentioned that you did them with a footing tool and you've actually put a stem and a foot. Did you do those on the lathe as well? Yeah, I have a footing tool. And uh, it, it's it's very uh, very easy to make a perfect foot with a footing tool, and the thing about making um, goblet feet and stems on the lathe is, uh, especially the feet, is that the footing tool cools the the iris orange quickly, and just creates some beautiful colors. So I really had a lot of fun. Um, you'll see some people pictures of pieces that were done, uh, goblets that were done that way. And yeah, the way I do goblets on the lathe is I'll, I'll, I'll uh, remove the piece with a stem and then I'll create the foot with a stem and then I'll put the two together in another session. So I, I don't, I don't create the goblet, the cup, the stem and foot in one in one piece, I I, uh, I assemble them afterwards. We'll have to do another a whole another demo about that. Sure. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I can show off the uh, the footing tool and how that works. So I think I said earlier that, you know, you, you finish all of these a little bit differently. And, you know, the first one that you finished, you were more than happy to call it good at, at about this point. And then, you know, the next one, you went a little bit wider with it. But then I think this is the one where you end up going like full on tumbler, like something that's easy to drink out of. And it looks like you kind of do it in stages with the tweezer tool, and I'm assuming it's because it's so thin. If you get it too hot, you'll get it really wonky, so you kind of hit it with the paddle to stabilize things, heat everything up, and then do the tweezers again. I'm also thickening the lip. 
Um, okay. So I have to spend a little time sort of opening it up and then and then reducing it back down again. And uh, and that will create stability. Okay. And then, uh, you know, a nice, a nice uh, even layer of heat makes for an even opening. So. And what kind of gloves are those that you're wearing? You don't wear them all the time, but uh, they they must be pretty key for working so hot in the flames there. Those are, they're called high flex and uh, they are, I just got a new pair and they are, they are really pretty amazing. And it is, it is true. I mean, you, you're, you know, your hands get very close to the heat with the lathe. And uh, in order to be able to do a lot of this, you really need, you need glove protection. I mean, I'll frequently take the gloves off uh, when I'm doing delicate, uh, tricky moves. But um, you know, it is it is. Uh, you'll see that. In fact, I notice just about every you know every few sessions, I'll have my hand right in the Bunsen burner. <laughs> <laughs> Things do get a little hot. If it wasn't for the glove, I'd definitely get burned. Why is my hand sweating? <laughs> So, yeah, you get a lot of protection, and I, I think you just you just really need gloves for this particular technique. And that looks like you're getting that lip nice and nice and gooey. Yeah, yeah. I'm you gonna know, at some point I'm gonna get the paddle on it, try to get that that rotation out of it, that little bit of. But right now I'm not that worried about it because I know. It, it always shapes up in the end. And again, yes. the lathe can look more, uh, you know, out of whack. Right, absolutely, yeah. I mean, if you took many of the drinking glasses that I own that weren't machine made, I'm sure you'd stick them on a lathe and they'll look a little wobbly, but. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping that a lot of people um, take up this technique and I'm sure we'll see some amazing work because they're, you know, they're. Well, this has got to be a lot easier on your body than working out of the furnace um, or really even is. just on the torch without the lathe, honestly. It really is. Yeah, it is a lot easier. Uh, and again, like it's also it's a lot more energy efficient. I would say cost wise, you can, you can do all this without a furnace. And, uh, you know, the, the furnace to run even the, the, the mini dragon for 24 hours is, uh, is about like filling your car with a tank of gas. And, and here's, uh, here's that, uh, the wobbly spot. I said, um, I know that I've heard you talk about the, the whole wobbly where the cup's getting wobbly, but it's not really the cup. It's more of the, the jack line that you're establishing. Yeah. In fact, it has to get wobbly. One of the, one of the difficult things is making sure you've jacked the cup away from the rod. Um, there have been times when I thought I was done and I tried to make my, my cut and knock a piece off and found out that the rod was still stuck inside the, the foot of the cup. And then this one here is actually a, a different one where it wasn't quite jacked down as much. So it takes a little bit more to get it off. But um, traditionally in flame working, people will polish down the end, but um, you like to grind down the edges, which I think is probably a lot more efficient as far as making pieces with this technique. Yeah, you know, it's, it's fast and easy. And um, I find that even if I if I finish the bottom of a cup and I punty onto it and remove it, there's still, you know, there's still a little bit of a chip when I tap it off that I seem to want to, you know, go on the diamond wheel and polish out. So, you know, I, I, I figured that it's sort of a good production technique to just. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I. Bend them down. I love it. <laughs> this is one of my favorite glasses. This is like the, I, I love this particular shape for my, my wine. So. Yeah. Well, that's, mm -hmm. thank you. I, I, the, I was looking at a bunch of Swedish designs and liked the small 
that, that sort of small foot. Um, yeah, it, no, it's kind of nice. I do like stemless wine, like stemless wine glasses, but they can get a little unstable in this, and you know, adds a little bit of weight to the bottom. I really, I really enjoy it. Well, I'm so glad. Yeah, I mean, with thin blown work like this, it's good to have it's good to have some weight on it, and uh, so yeah, I think that that the foot design kind of works with the piece. So, Mark, since we shot these demos, I know that you've got requests for larger sculptural pieces. And I know mm -hmm. you've you've been able to successfully do some larger pieces. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to show some photos of that. Can you talk about the considerations that you have to think about when working larger? What What's different when you're working to this size versus mm -hmm. this size? This technique works great for for cups and vessels, but it also uh, it also works for larger work. Um, but again, it's very tricky to work, uh, to get these colors to pop, you really have to work thin. So working large, thin pieces is, is an enormous challenge, but I've, I've figured it out and, and I've been making some, uh, some, I'm actually working on a, about a 25 inch sculptural piece. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's definitely tricky, but um, in terms of generally working with a large gather of clear and uh, making larger pieces that are thicker, uh, the lathe is just amazing. Uh, you can make, you can make large thick pieces on the lathe with a larger blowpipe and uh and it's it's just a surprisingly um you know really easy technique not not i guess what i should say is it's sort of the magic of the even rotation over the over the uh the bunts and burners is just it's just a a very different way to work than going into the glory hole over and over again. Here's that photo that I was like that. Yeah. That's so much larger. Yeah. That piece is about, I would say that's about a half gallon if you were to fill it with liquid. And um, yeah, I was able to get the, the, the greens to pop. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, Again, it's both of those cups are, or both of those pieces are the exact same colors. Thank you so much for sharing your technique with us, Mark. Yeah. Um, look forward to seeing the rest of the gas conference and what everybody else has been sharing. And uh, cheers next year to an in-person event, I hope. Well, thank you very much, Carrie. Really Absolutely. appreciate it. Oh. And thank you to Gas for uh, allowing us to do this this uh, piece. I hope uh, I hope you all enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. And if anyone has any questions about the technique, they should feel free to contact me. We can get in touch with Mark at Corn Blue Glass on Instagram. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. Have a great evening and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. All right, Carrie. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.